Last week we saw that there's even discipleship in the Christmas story. And today we're wrapping all this up by talking about leverage. The leverage of discipleship. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read these words. This is New American Standard. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, some of you weren't here for all these messages, so this is going to be a little bit for you here. Do you remember what the definition of a disciple is? Well, a disciple is a personal follower of Jesus Christ who is a student learning to be like the Master. That's what a disciple is. That's what we all are supposed to be trying to do. Do you remember the definition of discipleship? Discipleship is modeling the teachings of Jesus and the Bible and passing them on to others. It's kind of what Paul was telling Timothy in the verses that we read. Discipleship models the teachings of Jesus and the Bible, passes them on to other people in a process that transforms our life to be less of yourself and more of Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes commitment. And do you remember what disciples, discipleship does? And what disciples do? This is important. Real discipleship does whatever it takes for people to know Jesus. Real discipleship does whatever it takes to go and make disciples. Remember that sermon that we talked about the Great Commission? It's a command. We are to go and make disciples. It's not optional. And real discipleship shows what a real disciple looks like. By the example that we set, by the life that we live, by the words that we speak. So other people see Jesus through us. People may not read the Bible, but they can read us if we are being like Jesus. The foundation of discipleship is preaching and teaching the good news. The good news is we know, go, and show. Everybody is a preacher, whether you like it or not. So what you have to decide to do is decide what message you're going to be delivering with your life, with your words. Because the word that's translated preach in the Bible most often doesn't mean a preacher standing up and talking to all of you. It means a Christian, a disciple, sharing what Jesus has done for you. That's what preaching really is. If we're going to leverage discipleship, the first thing we have to do is identify your circle of influence. Now everybody here today has a different circle of influence. Your circle of influence is the people you come in contact with on a daily basis. Maybe not even on a daily basis, but you come in contact with people. Part of 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, talks about Timothy entrusting what he had learned as a disciple of Paul and then faithfully sharing that with other people who could share it with other people. 
We have to sometimes be mentors to other people, and sometimes we have to be mentored ourselves. A challenge for each one of us in this coming year is look for someone who we can hold under our, our wing a little bit, who we can mentor, who we can bring along in the faith. And maybe we are in a situation where we need to look for somebody else that we can kind of go under their wing a little bit and let them kind of be our mentor. That's how disciples are made. That's how Jesus did it. He chose 12 guys and he took them under his wings for almost three years. And he showed them how to be a disciple. He showed them how to be a follower. And they learned their lesson quite well. Think with me about your circle of influence. The people you know. All of us have a different circle of influence because of who we are, what we do for a living, maybe our personality, our experiences, and probably a lot of other factors too that come into play in our circle of influence. But no matter what our circle of influence is, we all have a responsibility to be good stewards of that influence. Oh, yeah. You should use your influence on your family to influence them in a positive way for Christ. You should use your influence on your friends so that you bring them along closer to Christ on your co-workers if you're retired then maybe not co-workers but your other retiree friends classmates you're in school you have classmates that maybe you can have an influence on for Christ we all have leisure and hobby time use that to advance the cause, to advance the kingdom by using your influence. Maybe your neighbors. Do you know who your neighbors are? Do you know their names? Do you ever try to insert Christ into a conversation with them sometimes? They aren't Christians? Here's a big one. We need to use our influence in social media you're on Facebook or Instagram or uh, any of those other things, use your influence in those areas as well. We have to identify where we can have influence. And when we do, then we can go to town at being a disciple and helping discipleship move along. And this is where leverage comes in. We have to leverage our influence. Now what is leverage? Well you probably know it best from using a bar to pry something. You know, uh, maybe you're, you're having trouble getting something open and so you use one of those advertised things that you put on the lid and helps unscrew it, you know. That's leverage. Using something that, that's beyond you to have more force to do something. A teeter-totter is maybe a good example of leverage. You know, if somebody's on both ends and you can make it go back and forth because there's weight on both ends. If there's just somebody on one end, it's pretty hard to make that teeter-totter work, isn't it? Yeah. But that's leverage. Here's a definition of leverage in regards to using our influence in our, our circle of friends. It is using your influence in a circle to get the maximum advantage for Jesus Christ. It's the ability to act or to influence people, events, decisions, so that you sway them closer to Christ. That's leveraging your influence. That's making a conscientious effort to help people come closer to Christ. 
We all have influence, but not all of us leverage our influence for Christ. Oh, yes. Yeah. To do that, you use what God has given you with the people God has placed in your life every day that you influence. This means you'll need to be intentional about looking for opportunities to practice leveraging discipleship and influence. We, we need to avoid negativity and always strive to give God the glory in what we do, in what we say, in who we are. We're the child of the King. We're the child of the Savior of the world. Let's act like it. We should practice Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Father. Glorify Him. When we leverage our influence for Christ, something <coughs> is going to happen. We need to bear much fruit. We've been talking about discipleship all this month. And I, I hope you have a clear picture of what it is. Because if you don't, then I fail to communicate what discipleship is. But even, even more than that, you have failed to be open to what God wants you to say and know and do. There's a sure way to know if you are being a disciple. It's found in John 15, verse 8, which says, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. That word prove is a very interesting word. It reminds me what Jesus himself said in John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. 2019 is just a couple days away. I hope that in this new year coming up that you'll come up with some kind of a Bible reading plan so that you, you get into God's Word every day. And that you don't just read it, but that you meditate on it. That you apply it to your own life. Put it in your heart. The word prove means to, to show, to demonstrate the truth or the existence of something by experience and by absolute truth. Bearing fruit will do two things. Number one, it says it's going to give God glory. It's going to glorify God. And number two, it proves you are a disciple of Jesus. If you don't have any fruit in your life, then there's something wrong. And you're not being a disciple. Matthew 5.16 is a very good example of what we're talking about. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So where's your fruit? Where's your light? Where's your salt? Those are the things that will show that you are truly a disciple. Look for someone that you can disciple. Look for someone that you can mentor. Look for someone that you can influence and bring closer to Christ. Don't get in a hurry. It may not happen overnight. But pray for that person. <coughs> Go to that person. Show that person what a disciple is. And share with them the good news so they can know Jesus. How will you leverage your influence so that others see Christ in you? Oh, yes. Much fruit is born for the Lord. If others see that Jesus means so much to you that you have become one of His disciples. Maybe they will want to become one too. Oh, yes. 
your one act of obedience in knowing, in going, in showing, has the potential to influence countless lives for eternity. I don't know about you, but that's something I want to be a part of. The, cry, the crowd cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And their influence caused an innocent man to go to the cross and die. Here, Pilate found no fault in him. But yet, the influence of the people crying out, crucify him, caused him to send an innocent man to death. An angry, angry mob can get so worked up that they're, you know, in an old western movie, they, they want to hang somebody. Vigilante justice, they call it. Unless the good guy steps in and says, no, wait a minute. We all need to be good guys and good gals and stop what's going on in this world of ours. And the way we do that is by sharing Jesus. <laughs> Don't allow the world's sinful influence leverage you to do something wrong. Instead, use the Christ influence that you have in your circle to influence people for good. For Jesus. You may not think that you can do very much for the Lord. But you can I want to tell you a story. It's a true story, but the story that's going around has some things that have been added to it that aren't true. A little girl left 57 cents for a new church. That's the true part. But the version of the story that's circulating is not so true. Let me give you the true story. The little girl's 57 cents did inspire the efforts that resulted in the purchase of property and the use of some property, some construction of some buildings, but it didn't actually purchase the property outright. It cost more than 57 cents. The first-hand account of this what is in a sermon. It was delivered December the 1st in 1912. And since then, a lot of some things have been added. So what I've done is looked at the sermon, and here's what the sermon said. The sermon was given by Russell H. Conwell, pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Conwell said the little girl's name was Hattie Mae Wyatt. She lived near, the, near his church where the Sunday school was so crowded that the people had to be turned away. Hattie Mae was one of those who was turned away. Sometime after that, Hattie Mae got very sick and died. Conwell was asked to do her funeral and the little girl's mother told him that Hattie Mae had been saving money to help build a bigger church and gave the minister her little purse and it contained 57 cents. Conwell took the 57 cents, turned it into 57 pennies, told the congregation the story of little Hattie and how she couldn't come to Sunday school because they didn't have room. Some of the members of the church formed what they called Hattie Mae, the White Mike Society, in memory of Hattie Mae. They took the 57 cents and people bought a penny. That produced a total of $250. And then the rest is history. 
54 of those 57 cents were given back to Reverend Conwell. He made a display that's hanging in the church to this day. With those 57 cents, a house was bought next door to the church in which the first classes of Temple University were held. Later, the house was sold so that Temple University could grow. And in this place, the Good Samaritan Hospital, which is now Temple University Hospital, was built. So you see, even though Hattie Mays 57 cents didn't do all of this, it was the inspiration that got it all started. One act of kindness can do a world of good and make all the difference in the world in somebody's life. Hattie Mae Wyatt had a testimony that's gone long, long past her time. Hattie Mae was only a little girl, but she had influence that was leveraged into something great. Made a difference in the lives of many people and is still making a difference in the lives of people today. Each one of us, each one of us here today, we can make a difference in someone's life for all eternity. What are you going to do? What leverage are you going to use to help disciple someone else and bring them closer to Jesus? In your circle of influence, what will you do for Jesus? We're going to sing an invitation hymn this morning. The challenge has been put there before you. Now it's time for you to decide. What are you going to do? Who are you going to make a disciple? How are you going to be a better disciple? How are you going to change our world? You need to make a decision today about that, about becoming a Christian, about accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, about being a part of this congregation. We invite you to come to your stand.